Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. I've got a truly special episode lined up to you, broadcasting straight from Latitude 59 in Estonia. And I'm thrilled to welcome not one, but two guests here that have come to see me on the show floor. It's Raina Sternfeld and Tomasaku Sahara, who are the dynamic managing partners at a company called Nordic Ninja, which is a unique Japanese and Estonian joint venture. And I want to learn more about the technology and also the strengthening of ties between countries and continents and fostering a collaborative tech ecosystem. Thomas Akko, he brings extensive experience in investment, financing clean technologies and fostering growth in the tech sector. And his main focus is on climate tech, energy, blockchain applications, contributing significantly to the evolving technology landscape. Whereas Reina, he's an accomplished founder turned investor and has a rich history in building technology businesses across the US, Europe, Japan, and much more. So I want to learn more about their unique perspective and experiences and the opportunities brought forth by founder and operator-led VCs and the imperative journey towards digital and sustainable transformation. But enough from me. Buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Estonia, where today's guests are waiting to speak with me. So a massive warm welcome to the show, guys. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Right. First of all, thank you very much for having me us. And my name is Tomo Sohara. I'm Japanese and I'm based in the, uh, Finland. And I'm a managing partner and the founder of the Nordic Ninja VC, which is focusing on the early stage investment in Nordic and Baltic. And hi, thanks for having us. My name is Reiner Sternfeld, uh, another managing partner of Nordic Ninja. Uh, I'm uh, a former founder turned engineer. Sorry, yeah, engineer turned founder, that's more <laughs> correct. Uh, and then from there on, uh, became an investor. So I've been building companies for over 20 years and spent eight years in Silicon Valley before. And after m- my last company got acquired, um, I joined Nordic Ninja since I spent quite a lot of time in Japan and between Japan and, and San Francisco. And so I felt like the, the bridge between Japan and the Nordics or Europe in general is a worthwhile mission to pursue while making high ROI investments. And so uh, that's why I moved back. Sounds like there's so much to unpack there from Japan, Estonia, the Nordics and Silicon Valley. So I must admit, when I first read about a Japanese and Estonian collaboration, connecting Japan with European founders, building a sustainable future, I thought to myself, there's got to be a story here. So can I ask you to share the story be- behind this collaboration? Yes, right. I mean... Okay, going back to, for example, uh, 2017. So when I was running the well, Japanese growth plant, at that time, like I was feeling like so many Japanese corporate is struggling for the open innovations. As you can imagine, for example, like 30 years ago, the, the, I think the majority of the top 50 in the world in terms of the market capitalization are the Japanese companies. But nowadays, it is only one single company who has been Listed on the like a top fifty on in the world, just the Toyota. Right. So uh, literally, I mean, Japan lost like a solid decade. I mean, three decades. I mean, for in terms of economy, and so that's why they are very hungry to run the startup ecosystem. And so, so so many Japanese corporate is creating their own corporate venture capital in Silicon Valley, but no one is interested in Europe. And then I came across like a couple of like investment cases and also the great founder in Europe. And then at that time, I was thinking that what if, if we create like a, I mean, Japanese VC, if we connected the European great startup and founders and the Japanese big corporate. And then I came here, I mean, the Estonia and Lithuania, the top of like three Baltic countries, because at that moment, like a number of the startup and unicorn per capita in this region is the highest in the world. Wow. Yes. And. But in Japan, you know, I mean, Japan is the third largest economy, but we have only like a three or four unicorns. Mm. Yes. We don't need to measure the biggest, I mean, the size of the startup ecosystem by the number of the unicorn, but still, I mean, the number of the unicorn, number of the startup per capita is really important. Mm. But in Japan, it's the lowest and in, in the Asia and but Estonia and Lithuania and Finland, this region is the like highest. So literally, I fell in love with the startup ecosystem in Estonia. Then we came up with ideas how we can collaborate, how we can create the the fund. I mean, from the from the Japan to the Estonia, and then 
Yeah, 2017, that the, I went here, I traveled a lot, and I met the other uh, partners from the Estonia, and then our discussion was started. Fantastic. I've got to ask the name as well. Is there a story behind the name? Uh, Nordic Ninja. Right? Yeah, Nordic yes. Ninja. Well, I mean, actually, we had a two options. Yeah. I mean, Nordic Samurai and Nordic Ninjas. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, samurai are the ones who show their superpower uh, by using the actively, um, well, actively taking the credit in a battlefield for the public eye. But on the other hand, the ninja has never shown, I mean, never appear in the public eyes because they wanted to act as a master's, I mean, uh, yeah, secret or hidden the superpower. And that we are investors and we are not a founders, we are not entrepreneurs of the companies. But from my point of view, from our point of view, that in the startup field, the entrepreneurs, the founders should be highlighted. So we are the investors, we want to support like behind the scenes. So that's why we want to uh, the ninjas. Love it. And I'm conscious for anyone listening anywhere in the world, hearing about Nordic Ninja for the very first time, can you offer an overview of, of exactly what it is and also what makes you different from your competitors out there? Yeah, happy, happy to. Uh, so Nordic Ninja, uh, I would say two different things uh, that make us unique. First, we are the largest Japanese VC in Europe, uh, uh, backing companies uh, working on uh, climate tech, deep tech, and digital society solutions. So we invest in the future we want to live in. Uh, and that's a very important part. The second uh, is that this is an operator led VC fund with deep engineering uh, backgrounds. So we can combine our global Japanese networks uh, with the deep expertise of actually building deep tech companies uh, and help them to scale. You know, less than 10% of uh, uh, VC partners in Europe have an operator experience and even fewer have an actual engineering, uh, deep engineering background. So we bring those two things together to create a unique VC fund, not only in Europe, but in the world. And so uh, we have been doing that for four, four and a half years now. Uh, we have uh, 20 companies in the portfolio. All four have become unicorns uh, and a handful of others show similar promise. So uh, we believe that uh, with this approach, we can we can re- truly achieve great partners uh, with the founders, but also co-investors. So we um, have seen already today that by just focusing on the Nordics and the Baltics, the world, world uh, travels. Yeah. So one third of our deal flow actually comes outside of the region now without you know, any, any marketing or any effort. But I think when you think about this as a founder, they don't care. Yeah. You know, they, you're just like, oh, these people can help me. So you can scale through the world, through London, San Francisco, New York. Yeah. But we add another layer, which is a global network of 120 blue chip companies from Japan that are global. So... It can connect them with vendors of particular components or sales channels or other types of deep engineering expertise. And so we, we, we think that it's, uh, it's something that uh, exists in the U.S. Uh, in spades, mm. but not so much in Europe. And I think I've been to, what, six, seven tech conferences this year so far, a lot in the U.S., and the biggest trend is generative AI. That's all anyone's talking about. But here... It's deep tech. That is a phrase I'm hearing again and again. And right. for any business leader that might be listening, thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa I've, I've missed this. Can you just give a, a very brief overview of what we, right. we mean when we say deep mm-hmm. tech? Obviously, different countries would define this differently, but these are generally companies that would require significant R&D uh, uh, capital before they can commercialize it. And, mm. and this uh, has become a thing in, in Europe, uh, mostly due to technology-driven universities, tech clusters that have actually uh, a lot of expertise in, in technology, but less so in commercializing it. Yeah. And so AI is embedded in, in all of those. So for instance, you know, most of the companies we have invested in are um, utilizing or developing their own uh, AI uh, models. Um, we, you know, look at um, companies uh, that are, quite often software-driven hardware, like half of our portfolio and our first fund is focused on what we call moving atoms. It means how do we, uh, you know, go to point A to point B as humans and how do we ship uh, stuff, goods from point A to point B. It has a massive carbon footprint mm. and and uh, the unit economics, you know, it's not 
that great. So you have to employ AI, you have to digitalize, you have to make better uh, user experiences work. Um, you have to maybe unpack the whole value chain and, and you know, bundle them together in a different way. So that's what we've been doing quite a lot. Um, so that's why we don't generally talk about AI as such, because we feel that AI, uh, like core AI development is done elsewhere. And what I mean by that is, you know, we have, you know, DeepMind, you know, in the UK, uh, you would have OpenAI in San Francisco. Um, there are not that many centers that develop core AI capabilities, but you could utilize a lot of it. And then with each mile, with each transaction, uh, your private uh, AI model can become better and therefore create defensibility. So. Well, honestly, from the investor's perspective, deep tech is quite hard. Yeah. Of course, it takes a lot of time to scale up and also it's a bit difficult to validate this technology to prove or not. And I also think in general, those kind of deep tech uh, require the massive capex, a massive ton of the money. And the, of course, like a computer, like a SaaS business and just a software bank company, and it's quite hard. So that's why like some investor doesn't want to make an investment at all into the deep tech. But at the same time, like after COVID was happened, after Ukraine situation was happened, the world is realizing that we need the deep technologies or otherwise we cannot welcome like a great sustainable world. For example, I mean, after, uh, well, Ukraine situation was happened and the Europe well needed to face the challenge about the uh, scarcity of the energy. Mm. And definitely, I mean, the massive like uh, CapEx and also the R&D, um, needs to improve the energy capacity and also to create a new innovative technology for the energies. But at the same time, we, I mean, not only the Europe, but also the Asia as well, that we cannot rely on only the oil and gas from the, yeah, from the other countries. So, which means that we need to develop a new solution, not only from the energy, but also entirely the other. I mean. Can I add one thing? I, I, like For me personally, every, every one of our partners is looking at their own kind of strengths in, in the field. So for me personally, it's AI, climate, and something I call creativity. Mm -hmm. So the AI and climate sort of balance each other out. There are different things. It's, it's horizontal. You can look at how do we reduce carbon footprint? How do we utilize AI? But the creativity aspect is really important to me because I feel like when companies create tools and or systems for third parties, empower their creativity and express their best ideas, whether it's technical or, or artistic, better companies are created. Uh, uh, you know, whether it's like uh, some sort of a, like a tool that other creators can build like new apps or, or express their creativity artistically, or it's like some uh, intrinsic uh, sort of technology that's embedded into 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 other third-party systems, like whether it's a security thing, but you can use that to create better services or even new services, these companies have uh, very high engagement um, and uh, and low retention. And so the, the businesses tend to be extremely resilient and strong. And, and all of those companies generally um, have a global focus, right? So we come from an area uh, where we invest in an area, in Nordics and the Baltics, that have a total combined population of 33 and a half million people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's eight countries from Iceland all the way down to Lithuania. In Japan, you know, in Tokyo metropolitan area, there are more people, 38 million people. So the founders here locally uh, focus on global markets from day one because that's their only way. And therefore, we also look for our number one teams in the world who just happen to come from this area. And by number one teams in the world, I mean number one in the world in their respective domain, obviously. And, and that I think we have uh, achieved quite well with our fund one. And on the topic of founder and operator-led VCs, what kind of advantages or opportunities do you think they bring in today's economy? Well, we measure that quite closely. What do we do with different companies? There's no one size fits all. There's not what, you know, we, we, we track it. And so therefore we have pretty good data on that. Yeah. Uh, as former founders and operators ourselves, we know firsthand the difficulties of uh, in building and scaling tech businesses. And so 
uh, particularly those uh, you know uh, in the in the difficult areas of digitalization of the established industries, uh, which is still in its infancy. We feel sometimes we're talking about it too much, but when you look at the data, it's it's still very early. Uh, and of course, climate tech. And so, building a, companies like that is extremely hard. Uh, the fundraising, um, building out executive teams, going to market. Um, so that these are all the things we can help with. And then in addition, as mentioned already, we can build a bridge between Japan and Europe because both have strengths that we believe can be put together to to create a, a kind of a stronger union. Fantastic. And of course, we are recording this episode live at Latitude 59 in Estonia. And I'm curious, there's two people that have been wandering around the show floor, having so many back-to-back meetings and uh, keynotes that you're watching have any conversations themes trends or or ideas here captured your imagination as you mentioned earlier that uh, i think that this conference latitude 59 was focusing on the deep tech yeah. that's kind of generative ai or blockchain or whatever yeah. this is uh, uh, quite a booming in japan and the us but uh, here is a different uh, the focus on the deep tech and i was quite uh, surprised that the they were discussing so many cases about defense technologies. As you can imagine, like for def- defense technology is quite controversial. Yeah. And of course, like from the investor, the VC point of view, the defense sector it was one of the yeah one of the controversial area for the investor to make an investment as well as like a porn and tobacco, drag or gambling, something like that. Yeah. Basically, it's uh, a Clearly, uh, the the point has been changed after the Ukraine situation was happened, and from the Japanese point of view, I, this is like a, I mean, a more controversial. I mean, compared to the Europe, because yeah. as you can imagine, like Japan is not allowed to have a military from uh, by the constitution, but at the same time, like uh, there is no clear cut between like uh, military use cases and also like uh, I mean, just like a private use cases. So we need to discuss about how we can. How investors also adopt like dual use cases. So this is quite an interesting moment, and this will be also the spreading out from the Estonia, from the Europe to the all over the world. I guess. Hundred yeah. percent. Maybe maybe one comment on AI. I, I I do think that you know we we have to set the record straight, but most of our companies are either developing their own AI applications or are utilizing it. Uh, it's just that I don't think we have any companies that are directly building a generative AI business as such. Yeah. And historically, if you look at it, I mean, you know, I spent eight years in, in the Bay Area and I would say like I'm quite a, an Americanized European. Um, AI business and machine learning businesses, their profitability and unit economics have not proven to be that good, to be honest, uh, unless they are intrinsically built into the business model. For instance, uh, you, you asked an earlier question, like what has caught uh, our, our 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 mind or our, our eye in this yeah. on this conference. So one of our portfolio companies is Bolt, you know, ride sharing company, a mobility company that has you know beaten Uber in their own game, at least yeah. in this region. And the reason is that they've been extremely focused on unit economics, uh, really, really focused on on controlling the costs, but also utilizing and investing heavily into AI. They're not going around talking about the AI this and AI that, but they're just using it. And so with each driven, you know, mile, kilometer, the model becomes better. We have another company called Starship, which, you know, it's, uh, everybody in the world knows, you know, robot, you know, delivery robots. So you can ask a kid from Australia to Chile, they would draw you a Starship robot. They're truly the number one team in the world, but they're based here. Yeah. And so it's, it's all about AI. How do you make that happen? As the autonomy uh, of the robot grows, the utilization, uh, or the need for an operator decreases and therefore making it again the last mile delivery more cheaper and and that's what it's all about and we have a bunch of examples like that Verif again from Estonian online ID verification service with each verification session the model becomes stronger therefore bu- builds defensibility and again growing in the US and Europe so we like we don't like to think about like just European or American or Japanese company we really look for companies that have an opportunity to grow globally and uh, and then really build the future we want to live in. I, I, I'd say that's really something we look at. And I think Europe, or let's say Northern Europe and Japan are quite different when it comes to risk. But when it comes to moral compass, uh, privacy with, by design, you know, data, o- data ownership, 
uh, kind of design ethos, closeness to nature. I think that's where we are closer with Japan in the Nordics than we are with the U.S. But in terms of risk, we are closer to the U.S. So I think the Nordics are extremely good in that sense that we've combined both of those things to make like fast moving uh, companies that also uh, do good. It's funny you mentioned uh, being closer to nature. Two other big themes here are digital societies and sustainable transformation. Huge themes here. So what challenges and indeed necessities are needed around these these areas, do you think? Well, of course, the sustainable transformation that, let's say, uh, if we are think of thinking about like a climate change, of course, we need to tackle I mean, this issue as soon as possible. And so that's why, I mean, the old, uh, so many like, investors, the governmental funds, and wanted to uh, find like, a great solution to tackle the climate uh, action or climate change. Uh, but at the same time, like, uh, um, some people, I mean, needed to be changed. I mean, their mindset by digital technology. Uh, I will give the one example. Uh, this is not a company from the Estonians, but this is uh, one of our portfolio company, uh, the Climate View uh, from the Swedish company. And the, they are uh, using like AI plus like a science specific uh, methodology solution uh, to give the weapon for the literally for the weapon for the municipality or city to tackle the their climate action. So currently, the so many like mayors or head of like municipalities and we declare that we wanted to achieve the climate neutral by 2050, but they don't know how to achieve that yeah. because all the information is still like a monitor or managed by the spreadsheet, and then the, all the information is not well connected to each department. I mean, stored by themselves, and it's it's quite silo. Yeah. And then this company, the Climate View, uh, will enable the the cities to understand what they are in terms of like a climate action and they also they can analyze the city can analyze what kind of the major political measures can be done or should be done if you they wanted to achieve like a climate action and also that the currently the so many city and the municipalities are suffering from the funding mm. but at the same time like uh, so many investors wanted to purchase like a climate bond or climate green bond but there is no entire like a platform for that so the with climate bill solution the city use the uh, uh cities is easily to issue the climate bond and and the green bond so that all the investors and can monitors and the and and also the track the their progress and also the the most important thing is there's a lot of stakeholders and they can communicate the same language yeah based on the, this kind of a tool so I think that the digital society and the well, digital technology and the, and the sustainable transformation is not, um, yeah, it's quite well connected and it's, it's uh, quite necessary for both. Yeah. And what excites you both about AI and climate tech combined with this special relationship that you have between Japan and Estonia? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think the current generation of AI, um, uh, both in, in, in voice uh, and text and images, you know, um, can help quite a lot of industries. And I think, you know, humans plus AI uh, is much better than just humans uh, or, or just AI. Yeah. So put it, put it together and I think you will create a lot of new opportunities. New jobs will be created. Some uh, other jobs will be uh, transitioned out. Um and uh, I think every job, job is just a job, you know, and, you, you know, you, you finish one job, you start another job. And it's kind of normal. Um, so I think, you know, while we're doing all that, obviously, we need to talk about AI alignment, of what can mm-hmm. happen in the future. So in the current instantiation, it's you know, quite, quite a quite a boring tool. If you, yeah, there's some excitement, but at the same time, it's, um, it's only uh right that you put in the time to actually make it work because you know there's no you know value in itself just you know using like the latest you know gpt4 you have to make you create value because again it's the great equalizer everybody has an opportunity to use it so how how is that valuable no not really um so so that's one thing but yes i think when we talk about real world industries whether it's transportation like self-driving vehicles we have two well, sorry. Yeah, two. Yes, two companies in in, in self driving or autonomy, 
but then of course we have you know both Starship and Einright that are utilizing these technologies as well. So five companies in total that are dealing with this. You start to think about safety. Mm. One of these companies is Cognic in Sweden. It is building a, a, a vision test for for self driving vehicles because usually these uh, algorithms are uh, kept very close to the shirt. Uh, but in terms of safety, you know, safety belts have a specific sa- standard that you have to comply with. The same will happen with the self-driving vehicles. So before you're allowed on the road, you'll perform a vision test of sorts. And so Cognic is developing that technology. And we invest together with Jan Dylin, who is a world-known AI expert and and, uh, uh, and has, uh, you know, researched existential risk for the past you know over over 10 maybe 15 years now uh, one of the uh, founders of skype as well so so we look at those things simultaneously it's not one or the other they both exist one provides us opportunity the other one provides us risk and we have to deal with alignment to deal with that risk but i don't think you can really put it back in the jar 100 mm-hmm. percent with you on that and I think if we go back a few years, we, there was a time where we wondered if we would ever get to speak with like-minded souls on the conference show floor. But here we all are. It's great to be talking face to face. But when you leave here, I'm curious what what were the big takeaways of Latitude Fifty Nine? Um, what will you be thinking about on the way home? And equally, what can we expect from Nordic Ninja in the future? Yeah, uh, with Latitude, obviously we still have one and a half days to go. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, this is the same that I would respond with every year, which which uh, relates to Estonia. One of the things that I love about this is that how integrated the society is uh, in terms of different people and roles. So, you know, in the Bay Area, you, not only you would get a room full of just engineers or, or founders, you would get very specific types of engineers and, you know, hundreds or thousands you know, uh, you can create a company focused on only left-handed fishermen in the U.S. <laughs> and there's a market for that. Right here, what I like is that you have engineers and lawyers and designers, investors, you know, anthropologists, you know, uh, applied anthropologists, everybody coming together. So they're a part of that. And, and that's what I think makes the Nordics and the Baltics kind of special, that the society as a whole is well adapted and aware of technology as, a, as an... Um, very good user of technology and programming as a kind of a digital literacy. For instance, I'm one of the co-founders of Code Yuffie, which is a, a programming school for working professionals who are looking to retrain themselves in. Uh, so if you're like an electrician, you're like we have, we have the oldest is 62 years old, uh, an electrician is learning how to code. You know, journalists who need to use data, like investigative journalists, you know, data journalism, you need to write a Python script to to dig in some data, create some graphs. You're not really a coder, but you're using it. Otherwise, how can you even do your job? So stuff like that, I think, is happening. And that's what I love about Estonia. That's what I love about Latitude, that it brings it all together. So it's not like just everybody's included and everybody feels included. And um, that's what I like about this. I think, I mean, from my point of view, that Latitude is getting the more international year by year. Yeah. Uh, when I joined here the first time, like 2017 or 2018, I was, I think, the only Asian person who has joined, uh, I mean, really? the Furniture 59. And I was so popular because everybody asking, hey, why are you here? And where are you from? Why, why, why are you here? What did you bring? Something like that. But I think, for example, like this year, I saw like so many, I mean, Japanese face, a Korean face, and an Asian face. I think that already the number of the participants from Japan is already third largest. Yeah. Yes. I mean, after after the Finnish people and and the Baltic people. So, which means that like uh, the Sony, I mean, drew a lot of attention from the Asians. So Asian peoples wanted to also hear more about like uh, Estonian story. Estonia like a big successful story, not only from the Skype, but also like a recent like a couple of success story. So, and. and at the same time, Estonian founders doesn't need to focus on the Europe, not only the few Europe and, and, and the US. Maybe uh, they may be able to reach out to the Asia. This will be kind of a solid options after the Europe and the US. So, which which means that it will be also great, not only for them in the Japanese investor, but also for um, the European founders. So I think that's a beautiful moment to end. We've got three nationalities in this booth as we record this. Yeah. But for anyone listening, just wanting to find out more information about you guys, maybe contact your team or just take a deep dive in the work you're doing. What's the best starting point? 
NordicNinja.com. Nice and easy. You got that URL early there, but uh, I've seen how busy you guys are flowing around. I saw you yesterday, didn't I? Uh, uh, asking uh, for, for a presentation, but just a big thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule to speak with me both and enjoy the rest of Latitude. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. So as we wrap up today's episode, I want to extend a huge thank you to both Rainer and Thomas Aku for joining me here on Tech Talks Daily because I think their valuable insights on the synergies between Japan and European founders and the unique opportunities presented by founder-led VCs and the inevitable digital and sustainable transformation have been fantastic today. I think their commitment to building a sustainable future, fostering an international collaborative tech environment, is, is nothing short of inspiring. And I think the innovative work done by Nordic Ninja VC is a testament to the power of bridging gaps between nations and working collectively towards a better future. And I think that is a beautiful moment to end on today. So please, if you've got anything you'd like to add, email me techblogwriteroutlook.com. And I also invite you to join me again tomorrow. We've got another great guest lined up. But thanks so much for listening today. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Oh, 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 oh,